Hello everyone and welcome back to ASP.NET Core 1.0. My name is Steve Bishop and in this video we're going to be talking about inversion of control containers. So let's say you have some sort of class out there and that class has some sort of dependency that it needs injected into it in order for it to operate. So our class yells out to the ASP.NET framework, Help! I have a dependency! Well, the ASP.NET Core framework will respond back with an IOC container. I'll help you, citizen. You? But what can you do? Well, I have many classes registered to me. So you're a community college? No, no, I keep track of concrete classes. So you're in construction? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes. What manner would that be? Well... When your constructor is called, I provide the concrete classes you require. Sweet! I'll take a Class A and a Class X. Okay, but I'll need some memory and CPU in exchange. You sound more like a politician than a hero. We have to register with you? And provide you resources? Alright, you caught me. Vote IOC! Well, it isn't a perfect system. But it's the one that got elected by the people. Now, this silly little skit that I kind of gave you here was just to give you a demonstration of the relationship between the classes in an ASP.NET application and an IOC container. The classes basically ask the ASP.NET framework for an instance of a concrete class that matches whatever the dependency is. Now, the IOC container's job is to provide that class. It has a registration of all of the concrete classes that belong to uh, those different dependencies. And based upon the registration within the IOC container, it will return back a concrete instance of the class that the requesting class needs for the dependency injection. Now, that last line that I, t that I said here in the little skit, it's the one that got elected by the people. That's actually true. It was elected, but it was the way that ASP.NET Core was built through open source, right? Because it's an open source community in ASP.NET Core. So it's really the one that the people decided was the best solution for this particular problem. Now, inversion of control has been around for a while now. Uh, it's not anything new. You may be familiar with something called Ninject or Unity, and they both do basically the same thing that is now built into ASP.NET Core. Now, there is one significant difference, or, well, maybe it's really a slight difference, depends upon your outlook, but really ASP.NET Core does not call this an inversion of control container. Instead, they've gone with the label service provider. So you may hear the term instead of IOC container, you might hear service provider when in reference to this particular type of uh, process in ASP.NET Core. Now, service provider can sound a bit like a misnomer depending upon your background, because services tend to be thought of, in a lot of cases, to be like third-party data storage or some sort of service from some third-party plugin. And that's kind of what's happening here. You are providing some sort of third-party service uh, in, the, in the form of some sort of concrete class that's being plugged into the requesting class. So service provider does make sense as far as terminology, but you do have to be careful to not really confuse it with services themselves that you might have as far as a provider of some third party API. Now to see how a service provider works, let's go back to our dependency injection frame here where we have this nebulous grouping of classes, class A, Z, T, and C, of all different colors and shapes and sizes. And we have a business layer class, and let's say that this business layer class has some dependency injection requirements. It requires a triangle, and it requires a partial oval. Now before, it would just inject, we would just inject directly a class Z and a class C into the constructor of the business layer class. But with a service provider, we now have a registration that the business layer class can ask for an instance of triangle or an instance of partial oval. And the registration within the service provider will know, well, when the, when the business layer class requires a triangle, return back an instance of class Z. 
and when the business layer class requires a partial oval, return an instance of class C. So that's precisely what happens. Class Z gets called and inserted into the business layer class, and class C gets called and injected into the business layer class. So that's essentially all that a service provider does. It's acting as a third wheel that's going to go and ask, based upon the registration, to instantiate a new instance of the class that's registered with, within the service provider. Now, most of this actually just happens behind the scenes and it's built into ASP.NET Core. But there is one thing that we really have to focus on in order to make this inversion of control and this dependency injection work within ASP.NET Core. And that's the registration part where we have to say that if a class needs a triangle, return an instance of class Z. And if a class needs a partial oval, return a class C. And there's actually three different types of registrations that I'm gonna go over right now. So service providers actually have a lifetime, okay? And you need to be concerned with this lifetime because it does have an impact on how your data is going to be in its state or hosted within the application. Now, those three different types are singleton, where only one instance is held through the lifetime of the application instance. So every time that you need an instance of a service or an instance of a concrete class, a singleton will just create one instance throughout the lifetime of the application. Next, we have scoped, where one instance of a concrete class is created per context. And a per context would be basically for every time that a user logs in. Now, the third lifetime is called transient where a new instance of a concrete class is created for every single request. Now, this is important to know which one of these different types of service lifetimes you need for your application and for that particular instance of a class. If we look at the singleton, it does have a lower CPU and memory usage because there's only one instance ever created throughout the lifetime of the application. So it just creates one instance of that in memory and holds on to it. And you only have to do it one time, so the CPU usage is very, very minimal. Now, it can hold on to data changes in real time for all users. So it makes sense then that, you know, this would be a good class if there's some sort of information that needs to continuously be passed back and forth between all of the users for the entirety of your application. But it's not so good for persistence, where we're persisting it back to like a database or some sort of third party service like an API. So just be careful of that. It sounds great for maintaining real time data, but it's not so good when those, those pieces of data need to be stored back somewhere else. And it's really best used when all users need to share the same instance and data is not being persisted. Now, as for the scoped lifetime, it has moderate CPU and memory usage because it does need to create a new instance of that particular concrete class for each time that it gets requested by the user for the first time. Now, it can hold data changes in real time for a single user. So if any of this data needs to be provided to another user of your application in real time, scoped is probably not the solution for you. And it's okay for persistence, but it's not for real-time persistence to services. So in other words, if you have some sort of database that you're wanting to store your data to, say like a, a database context or a SQL Server database context in Entity Framework, as long as you're constantly making the call to save changes, this makes sense as a solution for a lot of cases where you can persist the data back to the database as soon as it's being created or deleted. But it doesn't have any sort of cross communication between other users except for through that database. So it's not really real time to any other users and it's not really real time to any of the services that might be uh, hosting where your data is being stored. And finally, it is best used when you need one instance per user session and services are not real time, okay? So if you have a need for just one instance per user session, because you wanna have just a, a little, just a little bit of memory and a little bit of CPU usage is okay, uh, and you're not really concerned all that much about real time data transforms be, 
you know, with the services and stuff, then this is perfectly fine. Now the transient, as I said, creates a new instance for every single request. That means that there will be a higher CPU and memory usage because it has to create a new instance every single time that there's a new request. Now it only holds data and state for one use at a time. Now this actually makes it better for thread safety. So it's good for persistence, but it can take longer for services to respond because it has to spin up a new instance of that class every single time. And if it has to do that and you have multiple requests that might be uh, being threaded throughout your, your application, well, then it may take a little bit longer for all of those different instances of the classes to spin up. Now, the reason why this is good for persistence is because you're essentially constantly checking for the state at the time that you make the request. And same thing with the storage of state. It goes back and saves it back to the database pretty much on demand. So every time you open and close it, it's getting the latest and greatest information from that third party application or like a database. So it's best for stateless requests, like with web API and RESTful services, or if you have a functional style programming that you're going for. This is because it's constantly checking for the latest information from those services before returning back a result. And that's really one of the key components to functional style programming is that you should be newing up a new instance of an object every time. You should not be maintaining state within an object. You want to make changes and return a new instance. So it's really good for web API and RESTful services as well as a functional style of programming. So we're gonna hop into Visual Studio and we'll focus on registering our services within the setup class of our ASP.NET Core application. So just a quick recap of where we're at after we set up some dependency injection for our customer's controller and our customer's repository. We have a DB context private, uh, private variable called DB that's inside of our customer's repository. And the customer's repository inherits from this interface called iCustomer's repository. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that anytime customer's repository gets called, there is some sort of instance of AdventureWorks context that gets injected as part of the constructor. And not only that, but if we look at the customer's controller, we once again have the same thing. We have a iCustomer's repository class that needs to be injected into the constructor of our customer's controller. And if we try to run this right now, it's not going to work because we don't have any way to inject this, uh, an instance of iCustomer's repository into the customer's controller. So now if we try to go to customers and get the index view, we're going to get an unhandled exception occurred while processing the request. And we could say unable to resolve service for type Contoso RTM repositories iCustomers repository while attempting to activate the customer's controller. So that of course is because our MVC, uh, our MVC architecture here is set up that it's using MVC with default route and that is just creating an instance of customer's controller and it's not really receiving any information about how to inject an instance of iCustomer repository into a, an instance of customer's controller. So if we look at our startup class, we'll see that there is this configure services method here, and we can see that it gets called at runtime. And you can use this method to add services to the container. Okay, so it's kind of alluding to an IOC container because it says container. Uh, and that's really essentially what this is. It's a service uh, resolver it's an IOC container that's inside of this configure services method. Now, we already actually have one of these inversion of control containers set up. We already have a service registered within this configure services method, and that would be the Contoso context. So every time that there is an instance of Contoso context required somewhere within our application, this add DB context method registered an instance of, con uh, of Contoso context to create a new instance of con uh, Contoso context each time 
and passing along some options along with each instance. And those options were to use the SQL server, oops, to use the SQL server with that particular string. So we actually are already using an inversion of control. Okay, we're already using it and you may not have even realized it. But we can do more than this. We can register our own services like the one that we have here for the iCustomers repository. Now the way that we do this is we don't use the addDB context because that's a special method specifically for contexts that use the databases, okay, for entity framework and such. Instead, we're gonna tie into the services object that's being passed in as an iService collection when the configure services function gets called at the startup of our uh, of our application it's getting passed in an instance of iService collection called services and we're going to add I should probably capitalize add and for this I'm going to say let's go ahead and add scoped for now and this is going to be an instance of iCustomers repository okay so we're going to add scoped and here we need to pass in a, uh, a type, okay? And that type will be the type of service to add. That's gonna be a service of iCustomers repository, okay? So whatever the object is that needs to be injected, whatever the type is that needs to be injected is the service that you're going to be providing. So iCustomers repository. Now next, I'm gonna add a comma here and I can actually pass in the class that is the implementation or the concrete class that should be the instance whenever there is a request for iCustomers repository. So this is the service that's being requested. What is the concrete class that implements that service? Well, that would be our customer's repository, right? Because customer's repository has an, is uh, you know inherits from iCustomers repository, so we can use customers repository as our actual concrete class to instantiate whenever iCustomers repository gets called, and we just finish that off. It's got a default constructor, and that's it. That's all we got to do to register this customers repository concrete class as an instance of iCustomers repository. So let's go ahead and save that and let's run our application again. So we'll go to our customers index view and we got another unhandled exception error. Unable to resolve service for type entities adventure works context while attempting to activate the repository class, the customers repository class. Well, if you recall, our customer's repository class, again, has its own dependency that needs to be injected, an instance of AdventureWorks context. And we could add that as another DB context. So we could do services, add DB context. And this instance was AdventureWorks context, okay? Now, we already have in the AdventureWorks context uh, if we take a look at it, I'm just going to right click and go to the definition here. We already had have been passing in for the option builder, the options builder on the on configure. We're creating an, uh, that use SQL server with the string being passed into it. So we don't need to have an identical setup here, okay, where we're passing in the options uh, for each instance of Contosa context. We don't have to pass in the options to uh, to the constructor. So that's actually fine to leave this just like this because we already have that information essentially built into our AdventureWorks context. Okay, so let's save that and let's see if this works now. Now we'll go to our customers index view again. And this time we get our response with all of our different customers. So this looks fantastic. This is doing everything that we need it to. Now, I just wanna illustrate one other thing here, and that is we don't necessarily have to register our contexts like this, uh, you know, these database contexts as a DB context. We could, instead of doing it as a DB context, we could specify that we want to add it as, say, a singleton. 
Okay, and this is typically not good to do with databases, but I just kind of want to show you that this is possible, that if there was such a need to register a service, uh, we could do it right here within the add singleton. Uh, you know, add singleton method or an add scoped or an add transient. In fact, maybe I should do that instead. Let's do a uh, add transient. Okay. Now, this add transient, it takes an instance of AdventureWorks context, and that is the service that we want to provide, right? We want to provide that as a service, but um, do we need to say what the concrete class is? Because notice up here we have iCustomers repository as the service class, and we had to specify a concrete class. But AdventureWorks context, that is really the only instance of AdventureWorks context we're ever going to have, right? We don't have another version of AdventureWorks context somewhere out there. You know, it's not, it, it does come from DB context, but DB context is so generic, and we wouldn't get any of the, the tables or the properties on it like we do with AdventureWorks context. So it doesn't make any sense to say something like DB context, right? This, this wouldn't make any sense. Okay, we could do that because again, AdventureWorks context inherits from DB context, but we also have Contoso context, which inherits from DB context, and that would just get really confusing. So rather than doing that, let's just try AdventureWorks context by itself, and we are not passing in an implementation, okay? Because if we take a look at the uh, cons the um, the different ways that we the different overloads of the add transient, we can see that we don't necessarily have to offer a second type to this. We could just say the service class that needs to be a service. So let's try that. We'll save that and let's run it again. And again, I want to reiterate, this is an add transient call of a database context not necessarily an add db context method call okay so we'll save that and let's run it so once again we'll go ahead and go to the customers index view and let's see what we get sure enough this works just fine as well so if you are not using a uh you know any sort of interface to declare your services like we were with the iCustomers repository, and you just have a single class that you know you're going to re-instantiate over and over again, and it doesn't really need to have any sort of polymorphism or anything like that, and it's not an abstraction of any sorts. It's perfectly fine to use add transient or add scoped uh, or add singleton in this manner where you just have the single class all by itself and it will get created. So that's a demonstration of how you can register your services and the startup class for an IOC container or for basically the services in ASP.NET Core. How about a funny clip for sticking around this whole time? The three wise men can start. <laughs> oh, God. That's great. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget, you can also head over to my Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash programming made easy. And again, easy is spelled with E-Z. And from there, you can donate at different levels. And even if you donate at the $3 level, you can get, uh, get early access to these videos ahead of time. So please don't uh, feel free to check that out and see if there's any sort of level that you want to contribute to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah.